Good afternoon and welcome to Discussion Bound. My name is Christy McMillan and I'm the Director of Learning and Engagement here at the Asheville Art Museum. Uh, today we will be discussing In the Shadow of the Moon, America, Russia, and the Hidden History of the Space Race by Amy Sherricks. And I'm so thrilled uh, to let you know that Amy is here with us today, as well as our associate curator, Whitney Richardson, who um, curated our current special exhibition, Meeting the Moon, um, which this uh, book was chosen in honor of. A few notes before we get started. You probably noticed that your microphone and video were muted by default. We welcome you to turn on your video at any time so that we can feel like we're sitting in the same room together. And in just a moment, I'll also make it so that you can unmute your microphone to participate in today's conversation. Choose a quiet room and close the door. Please silence any alerts from nearby devices as they can be pretty distracting during the conversation. If you do choose to turn on your video, try not to sit in front of a window, lamp, or other strong source of light or movement as it makes it difficult for us to see you. Use headphones and microphone for best sound quality. While you can log on using a smartphone, we recommend using a desktop, laptop, or tablet in order to see slides and meeting tools on a larger screen. Make sure that your screen name includes your first name and last initial or first name and last name, again, so that we know who we're talking to. In order to ask questions or make comments throughout the program, uh, we welcome you to unmute your microphone when uh, any of us ask for questions or comments or when you would like to jump into the conversation. A second way to participate is to type into the chat box and we will get to those comments um, as the conversation allows. Or you can raise your hand in the participant sidebar and when there's a lull in the conversation, I can call on you and ask you to unmute your microphone. The easiest and most efficient way to participate, though, is just to jump right in by unmuting your microphone. Finally, we are recording. If you prefer not to be recorded, make sure that your video and audio remain muted and use the chat box to sit submit any questions or comments that you have. As always, we've developed a couple of um, questions to get the conversation started um, or to give us some guidance, but we're not wedded to them. If at any time there are other things that you'd like to talk about, this is a conversation, so feel free. Um, here are the questions, though, just to uh, give us something um, to base our conversation off of. I don't want to leave them up on the screen, so I wanted to just go the, through them very quickly um, so that I could get them off so that we could see each other's faces. Uh, the first question was, if you got to spend a day with either Werner von, von Braun or Sergei Korolev, which one would you choose and why? What would you ask or talk about? A question that um, was very sort of briefly touched on um, in the book, um, but one that we had a speaker come a couple of weeks ago, um, talking about the importance that art played uh, in the space race. So before NASA was established and for much of its history, artists work with scientists to illustrate places or concepts that weren't yet reality as far as we knew or something that we could see um, in order to cultivate popular and financial support for the programs. Are there other examples you can think of when artists help people to imagine the unknown? Um, next question. Do you think the cost of the space race was justified? How can people dig deeper to find out the true stories of historical events beyond the version of history that exists in the collective consciousness? How should we honor the legacies of complicated people from history who did both great and terrible things? Is the story of the race to the moon relevant and important to modern re readers? Why or why not? The author included notes and chapters to add diverse points of view or things to consider that might not be part of the historical narrative, such as the experiences of women, people of color, or some of the prisoners or enslaved people working on the rocket program. Did these additions change or add to your understanding of history? How? I love this question. This was submitted by Whitney. What was your personal experience with the space race or humanity's pursuit of space exploration? Share it. And then finally uh, was a question towards the end of the book, if not on the very last page, um, from the Penamunda Historical Technical Museum. Werner Bon Werner von Braun was portrayed as enthusiast, dreamer, careerist, militarist, and nationalist. How do you estimate his personality? Was he a ruthless technician stopping at nothing in your point of view, or an ingenious realizer of space flight? 
So I am going to get these off of the screen and make it so that folks can unmute themselves. I would just ask that if you're not actively asking a question or making a comment that you leave your microphone muted. And Amy, I think you wanted to start us off today with a self-introduction and how did you get invo uh, involved and interested in writing this book? Hi everyone, um, thanks so much for having me. I never imagined when I wrote this book that um, a book club would read it. That's something that happens, but as an author, it's when you get asked, it's like, you can't, you can't quite believe it's happening. So I'm honored to be here. This is the first book club I've ever visited. Um, I um, am the children's book buyer at Malaprop's Bookstore and Cafe in downtown Asheville. Um, and I am also an author of books for children across all age ranges, picture book, middle grade, and young adult. Um, and I am constantly, as you probably hear many writers say, um, my daily life is, you know, a constant sifting of story ideas. I see things all the time that I think, oh, I wonder if that would be a, a good idea. I'm always trying to, to figure out what my next project is going to be. Um, and I came to this story um, in a very unusual way. Um, I had just finished writing my second book, which is about Asheville's black bears called Backyard Bears, Conservation Habitat Changes and the Rise of Urban Wildlife. And I didn't know what I was gonna write about next. Um, I love science and the natural world. And I knew that that was gonna play a part of it because I, I don't write fiction as a rule. My, my philosophy is I would rather look it up than make it up. Um, so I knew whatever I wanted to do, I wanted it to be nonfiction. And um, my mom gave me a great piece of advice because I was uh, having a real crisis because I didn't know what I wanted to write about next. She said, you know, just start watching, you know, watching documentaries about things you enjoy, just you know, watch Nova, watch PBS, you know, watch um, the Discovery Channel. So I took her advice and uh, I was watching, I had the television on late one night. Um, I can't tell you what the television program was. I can't even tell you what channel it was on, uh, but I had nodded off while I was watching television. And um, I thought I heard the narrator say something like the moon landing in 1969 was masterminded by a former Nazi. And I'm a lifelong space race enthusiast. I love NASA. One of the hardest things about this book was being objective about NASA because I am, I believe in everything NASA does. And when I heard that, I thought that, you know, it's twilight sleep in my dreaming. Um, but as a writer, um, I keep a notebook by my bed. So I wrote down, you know, space race, moon landing, Nazi question mark, and just went right back to sleep. And I woke up the next day and I thought, there's just, there's just no way that's right. You know, there's just no way I would know every Sunday morning, I pour a cup of coffee and I point my browser to nasa.com and I drink coffee and I read the NASA website. Like it's just, it's just what I do for, you know, entertainment. It's, 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 it's fun, but it's also, you know, satisfies this natural curiosity that I have. So I just Googled NASA, Nazi, moon landing, and I was reading for five minutes before I was absolutely fascinated. The first place that I went was Wikipedia um, because Wikipedia always has, you know, sort of a broad sketch of things. But of course, you never want to rely on that as a source. But lots of times, um, particularly um, Wikipedia pages that deal with big events like World War II or you know, certainly the moon landing will be very carefully sourced. So while you don't really want to trust the articles that you read on Wik Wikipedia, the source notes at the bottom can be very revealing and you know, by noon that day, I thought, I have got to read more about this. I have to write about this. I was fascinated by Werner von Braun. Um, the fact that he was, you know, this this former Nazi, but he took us to the moon. And how was this not, you know, page, par paragraph one, page one in my history book when I was a kid learning about NASA and the space race. I'm a child, I was born in 1971. So I came of age during the 1980s sort of the golden age of the shuttle program. Um, and the world still stopped. You know, we all remember this, the you know, classrooms came to a halt and we stared at the television in just absolute wonder at what was happening. And I was heartbroken. I mean, I felt betrayed. I felt betrayed by NASA. I felt betrayed by certainly my high school history books, which you know have betrayed us about many things as, as we're, we learn, but I was just fascinated. And I started on this sort of obsessive journey to learn about Werner von Braun. And there are a number of 
books written about Von Braun, um, but there aren't that many critical books about Werner Von Braun. And one that I highly recommend is um, uh, Von Braun, Dreamer of Space, Engineer of War, written by Michael Neufeld, who is um, uh, historian emeritus at the um, Air and Space Museum. And he wrote a very critical, fascinating biography of Von Braun. And I read that book and thought, this is the most fascinating, fascinating person I've ever read about in scientific history. And I never knew it. And I felt like the secret had been kept from me. And then as a writer of nonfiction, particularly for children and young adults, because textbooks can be, they're condensed and they leave out a lot, which we know. Um, I've learned to sort of force the other perspective on myself. And I thought, what are my blind spots? You know, I'm an American. Um, I am, I feel betrayed by NASA. So clearly I have a deep emotional connection to this agency that I, I believe in. Um, and and what, what, what does that mean that I feel like there was the secret kept for me? Is this my perception or was this actually true? And the more I read about Von Braun, the more I realized, yes, absolutely. It was a secret that was kept for a lot of the usual reasons mainly power and money and politics. And then I thought, well, I don't know anything about the Soviet side of the space race. I know about Sputnik. Um, and as much as I knew that Sputnik was the world's first satellite, the first object to leave this earth and orbit the planet, it never clicked in my mind that the Russians beat us to the punch because I am so steeped in this American pride in the moon landing and how deeply ingrained that is in us. And as fascinated as I was about Von Braun, Koryalov for me became the true fascinating character of the space race. He started everything and, you know, along the way, accidentally on purpose developed the intercontinental ballistic missile. So this idea that this vehicle of you know, space, you know, we come in peace for all mankind, you know, was also the ultimate, um, you know, weapon of mass destruction. And I'm embarrassed to say, even to you now, after three years of writing this book, that never occurred to me. You know, I just didn't connect the dots. And I thought, you know, maybe other people didn't connect these dots either. And in particularly, um, you know, this doesn't feel like ancient history to me, but to a 17 year old, you know, it's to me, it's like reading about, you know, many, many, many decades ago. And I knew that this was a story that I had to tell um, because I needed to make peace with it, which I think is the best reason to write a book is to try to, I'm trying to make peace with something or learn about something or reconcile some complicated um, idea. And I thought if, if I'm an adult who came up during the Cold War, understanding everything that I understand about it, intrinsically, and yet I'm completely blinded to the Soviet side of the story, particularly as a person living in the United States today with, you know, all of this um, sort of, you know, in a lot of ways, new Cold War that we're having with Russia. It just seemed like with every passing day, this book became more irresistible. And um, I started researching and writing. Thank you. Um, you mentioned um, and I don't even think it was written on, there's no way I think just looking at the book that someone would know that you had intended this book for young adults when you read it. Mm. And, you know, knowing uh, after sort of selecting it that you had originally written it for young adults, um, mm. I sort of with a critical eye as I was reading it was thinking, you know, what, what did she do differently? Mm -hmm. And I never felt condescended to while I was reading the book. Um, I felt like instead some of that extra information that you gave just sort of helped me not have to maybe have Google sitting right next to me to look up something that I probably should know but wasn't in my you know readily accessible memory. Mm -hmm. And actually was really grateful for some of the information that you added to sort of provide context, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's great to hear, yeah. If, if anybody else uh, had thoughts um, as a, an adult reading the book um, that, that Amy in, intended for young adults, but um, did you feel like it was readily accessible as an adult? Go ahead, Christina, you have your hand up. Um, am I unmuted? Can you, you hear are, me? You're good, yep. Okay, 
No, I love the fact, actually, the only way I figured out it was a YA book, because I have a library copy, and I went to the library, and it's under YA books, and I thought, oh, that's interesting, but because I find the history of the whole space program a little bit confusing, yeah. I absolutely welcomed this book. I thought it was so incredibly readable for someone an adult person like me who's lived through all of this of course um to put it so um in such an interesting fashion in such an easy format to read not too easy i never mm -hmm. ever came to this book and thought oh this is just a kid's book I'm really not learning very much here. I never did. I kept thinking, this is so great because it is so readable. And also because you threw in um, personal, um, little personal things that kept you going. It wasn't just a recitation of a year a name of that particular rocket, when it was launched, and what happened. There were, um, you put throughout the book, interesting personal asides that kept uh, me going. And this doesn't have anything to do with anything, but I happen to have lived in Huntsville, Alabama, five years of my life. And so wow. Ron Brown, the Air and Space Museum, all of that was literally in my backyard. I'm a librarian. I worked at the Huntsville Public Library for five years. Oh my years. gosh. <laughs> and every time, of course, you mentioned Von Brown and you described Huntsville, and a lot of this book takes place in Huntsville, of course, that drew me in even more. So congratulations. I thought Thank it you. was an awesome book. And I wanted, I feel now I would love to hand it to somebody and say, you must read this. Thank <laughs> this you. Really good. Well, feel free to do that. I'm sure that Amy <laughs> wouldn't have a problem with you doing that, Christina. <laughs> Absolutely not. Catherine, you said you agree. Do you want to unmute and... Yeah. I, I just um, really enjoyed all the details and the and the personal uh, again the personal lives and just it just kept me in, engaged and I, I was born in 67 but I lived in Cocoa Beach as a baby so my parents were there for the uh, the launchings and everything and it so so I think about like you said Amy about that that love you had for NASA. Right. Like, like I think of that as like my childhood because right. we were right there at Cocoa Beach. Yeah. I mean, it was a big wow. deal. And um, to read all of it, I and the head of NASA, uh, the first director having been with the SS, it just, um, it, it um, I don't know why it surprised me when I look at it now, of course, yeah. but it's something, it's something yeah. to, to, for me I, that I still need to like um, deal with almost emotionally. I know that sounds interesting, but you said it. That's how I felt. Yes. So I feel very, um, I don't know. I told my husband last night, he said, what president was that under? And I said, <laughs> Eisenhower, did Eisenhower let that happen. And I mean, he, right. you know, like, I think we just, we just don't know. So thank you, yeah. thank you for, for thank you. It, Amy, because- it's a big deal and it's a yeah. big um, shift, a di uh, maybe a shift because I was, I'm just being there and like, like we were all there. Yeah. My family, it was a big deal for my family yeah. and pride for America. Absolutely. And yeah. I still think, you know, we, we, amazing things were done. I just, I just have a, a things to work out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but thank you. Thank you for your research. And Oh, thank you. I was, yeah. I was fascinated. Yeah. I am going to give it to my son. He's 17. And I was oh, telling excellent. him, that you have to read this. So he's great. going to read it next. Yeah. Oh, I hope he loves it. Thank you. Oh, he will. He will. Yeah. I almost feel like this is history in the way that it should be written. Um, you know, that, you know, as I said, I, there were maybe clues that there were that this was written for young adults, but I mm -hmm. again, it wasn't 
it was few and far between where I said, oh, that's right, this is a YA book, right. but um, I'd say 95% of the time, I just felt like this is good, compelling way to write history. You know, you, oh, you, you chose like language that we could all understand, which is of course yeah. one of my big pet peeves with yeah. academic writing. Um, and it was very sort of conversational and you also went on tangents um, yeah. which I, my brain very much appreciates because that's the way I live my life. <laughs> you know, I get curious about something and then go on a tangent. And I felt like yeah. some of your chapters were like that, you know, you yeah. wanted to explore something right. sort of as an aside. And so yeah. I just found it to be really ex accessible. Um, but let's talk about um, some of the um, additional information and thank you mm -hmm. Whitney for for uh, prompting me uh, to put this question in that you had include included in your footnotes or in you know you would take sort of uh, take a sidebar on your narrative where you would add chapters about points that probably we as adults you know are perfectly aware that you know these are things that were happening in the world but we might yeah. not have sort of integrated them with right. our understanding of history we're very good as humans at compartmentalizing things right. um, and categorizing things and so you had talked about the experiences of women um i <laughs> I really got mad when um, you had written that she signed with her initials instead of her name, you know, just in Ugh. order not to rock the boat. She just felt, yeah. um, and help me with who that was. Yeah. Um, that she, she didn't want to rock the boat in terms of, uh, she just felt like she was happy to be, have a seat at the table. Um, you had talked about the, um, uh, uh, the hidden figures um, the women of color who worked as computers. And I loved that sort of anecdote about John Glenn saying, I don't trust the IBM. I only yeah. trust Catherine, you know, right. um, to do these. And then also you talked a lot about, and of course, I, maybe I had never thought about it this way, but that, of course, the concentration camp prisoners who were working on um, building these rockets under absolutely horrible, mortifying conditions were in effect enslaved people. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I might not have put that all together in my head. So can you talk about sort of how those um, uh, insertions uh, to help us have a more um, robust understanding of the narrative, sort of how you got interested in, in adding those viewpoints? Absolutely. It, for me, because this whole idea was spurred by the fact that I felt betrayed <laughs> by, by history, by educators, by, you know, by NASA even, um, and certainly by, you know, just the government in general that, that covered all of this up. It, it was important to me as a, as a person trying to reconcile this for myself. You know, I needed to make sense of it and I needed to make sense of it in context of what was happening at the time. And because, um, you know, particularly, um, you know, the, the late 1960s were such a turbulent time that in my mind, I think about, I, I forget that the space race was happening when all of this massive social change was happening at the same time. And it's like you said, I compartmentalize these things to a degree that, that I forget how they impact one another and how they overlap. And I realized that in making sense of that for myself, that I was going to have to make it really clear for young readers what was going on in the world at that time too. And that meant doing things that I wouldn't do if I was writing a book for adults, like you know, explaining um, you know what world what the impact of World War One was, um, and also knowing that I was writing for a young audience, knowing I couldn't go on for three chapters about World War One. You know, I had to say. This is what you know about World War One. This is important context. Now let's see how that that fits into the story of these two men's lives that I'm trying to intersect. And of course, um, in looking at this, one of the I read a fantastic book um, uh, by um, uh, a history professor, um, and it is called um, German German Rocketeers in the Heart of Dixie. Her her name is escaping me now, um, but it's a fantastic book. And she writes all about what it was like when these 
um, German scientists and technicians came to the United States. Not all of them were Nazis. Um, some of them were ardent Nazis. And I was talking with my editor about this book and she said, you know, they were in Alabama, you know, during the 1950s. And they're, you know, they're coming to this country to do work and they're getting ridiculously low housing loans. And, you know, let's think about, let's really dig into this history and connect the dots between what was happening in the deep South and what was happening um, with the, the, just the privilege that was extended to these folks um, without even a, I mean, the ability of, you know, of people in this country to um, demonize their fellow Americans and welcome, you know, their former enemy to me was like, I, I mean, it was, there were, there were days that I just, I sat at my desk and thought this, I would, I was quadruple checking my sources because I didn't believe it myself. You know, I was reading it and I would see it and I would cite it and quote it and then go back. I was like, this can't be, you know, but it was. And I think these pieces of um, context that I wanted to highlight, particularly throughout the book, there are places where um, like I do a short sidebar about immigration uh, because I, and I didn't, I couldn't go on for, I mean, my God, immigration, like, forever about this topic, but I wanted young readers to see that this history that to them seems so long ago is not, you know, all of these things repeat themselves. And I thought that that context was important, not only to make sense of the past, but to really um, sort of uh, have sort of a restorative experience with current events. You know, look at what's happening now and ask yourself how we got here. Um, and particularly as we think about going to Mars and beyond, how do we keep from making these same horrific mistakes again? Right. Um, for those of you uh, who read the book, uh, what did these sidebars or extra chapters or the way that Amy sort of took um, a different tack in, in uh, interpreting the history, what did that add for you? Well, no. I got, uh, I think, Carol, Catherine, and Christina, <laughs> the, the cuckoos, just like me, um, have, have some things to add. Uh, Carol, I think you were first. I had just finished Hitler and Stalin, uh, mm -hmm. The Two Tyrants of World War II by Rees, and was fascinated by the psychology of it. And then I started on the shadow of the moon. If you wanted to build rockets, you didn't have a choice but to join the party. So what comes first, principle, moral principle, or your lifelong desire to, to build rockets? And I think so, that was a really interesting question that was posed by the museum in Pinamunda about, you know, mm -hmm. how do you see Werner Braun, von Braun? And I love the way, Amy, that you described how they visualized it for people, that you got a token and you yeah. can put it in one or the other. Yeah, um, it's powerful. So, but what you didn't tell us was which one of the canisters had more tokens in it. How, <laughs> how did people visiting the museum sort of understand uh, von Braun? In the original um, draft of that section, I shared what the results of the, the sort of voting, these voting cylinders were. And my editor said, let's don't include that. You know, this is for young readers. Let's let them, let's leave it up to them. Um, but what was fascinating for me was that they were perfectly level. Mm. They were, I mean, I, it was the last place that I visited on this sort of epic, you know, road or, you know, journey that I did across Germany. And I, I was still standing there thinking, you know, this is so complicated. I don't know how to, I don't know what I think for myself and nobody else did either. Mm. You know, um, it was, um, it, it was, I, I've, I have a complicated understanding of, of Von Brown now that I think just comes from sort of living with him for so long. Mm. Um, but um, that complexity of his life is, you know, um, Neufeld calls him um, a Janus faced character. Um, and it's, you almost have to just leave it at that. 
because you, you, how do you, how, I mean, it's, it, you know, and, and to your point, Carol, like it's, um, you know, during the time period, um, you know, people did what they had to do to survive. Mm. Um, and, you know, the argument could be made that, you know, Von Brown should have spoken up. He should have been outraged. He should have quit. He should have been willing to, you know, sacrifice his own life. Um, and that would have been noble, but would that have done anything for any of the prisoners in Penamunda? Absolutely not, because he didn't have any power over what was happening to them there. Um, he would have been killed. Oh, he absolutely would have been killed. Yeah. Definitely. Himmler was kind of out to get him anyway, I think, um, after that, that one run in. But um, yeah, I think, um, I think it's, it's more about learning to make peace with the gray area. Um, and this certainly is something we get as an adult. Um, but trying to con convince young readers to, to engage with that was sort of my, my overarching thesis. Christina? No, I, I just felt you did that very well throughout the whole book. And still, once you read this book, I don't think there's a clear cut answer yeah. to whether it was right or, yes, it was wrong. But what I understood from the way you wrote it was that Von Braun had no choice. If he was mm. going to stand up for principle, right. he would have never come to the United States. Who knows? Right. We would have never perhaps had the space program in the way right. we did. Are we willing to forgive and forget, which obviously the U.S. government was willing to yeah. do that for a very long time, whether that was right or wrong, again, is a whole other topic of discussion. But I, I don't think, in my mind, that there will ever be a clear answer to yeah. that. And I think a lot of things in life are very much like that. Yeah, you do absolutely. what you have to do, but if you have a passion and a, and <laughs> a talent, he was an unusually brilliant man. Um, look what he gave to America. Yeah. I mean, but that's he, it's sort of what you're saying, but I, I could not stop thinking about that through this whole book. And it, of course, it's never going to be resolved, I don't think. And Amy, your ambivalence, I think, came through very clear as well. Yes, very much so. Whitney? Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, I don't, I don't think the question is, was he ruthless or ingenious? I think he was ruthless and ingenious. Like they're not mutually exclusive. Mm. And something too, Catherine said that reminded me, I thought this too of, of Eisenhower in his kind of being okay with Sputnik in a way, like realizing, wait, they beat us to this. He was like, oh good, that means we can do right. this now. <laughs> well, he had his own reasons, yeah. right? Because right. he had sort of ethical questions and by yeah. Sputnik uh, being the first and to, um, into orbit, it right. alleviated him from needing to make those decisions. <laughs> right. So he didn't have to be ruthless or ingenious. It, it, it's all, everything's got this double play going on, yeah. which yeah. is surprising and not at all surprising. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yep. Go ahead, Catherine. I do think um, the thing that I understand that when he was in Germany and Von Braun had to do what he had to do, but one of the really troubling things for me was when he would, uh, that he was known as a charismatic person. Mm -hmm. And, and that, and that, so, so you have the, how did he feel inside about what went on? Was there no, um, okay, so you have to do what you have to do, but then internally, do you ever acknowledge right. the gravity of what you were a part of? And so what scares me is the charismatic leaders or scientists who can sway the public to forget what they've done. And so that to me is troubling because it is so re repeated over and over and over That's where right. a charismatic leader will do horrific things and people will excuse it because of his charisma. And he's That's right. well, certainly he shouldn't have, couldn't have done that type thing. That's and right. I think that my issue is it's scary to me mm -hmm. that we can not ask. I, I don't have a right or wrong. I agree. I don't know that there's an answer. I know the, the camps are wrong. I've, I've, I know people who, whose families died in the camps. I know. So it's, 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 you know, it's um, a really hard question. 
But to me, the scary thing is the charisma. It is the charisma that that person of that intelligence and that way he looked could could win people over. And that should be out there for everyone to know. Because that is the kind of person that can get unbeknown, naive, or whoever just following, you know? That's right. And I think, you know, we've said a couple of times, several people have said, forgive and forget. But for the American people, there was no forgiving because we didn't know anything to forgive. There was only the forget um, because the American government was complicit in not presenting the whole story. They um, presented what they wanted or let Von Braun present himself uh, in the right. light that he wanted to be understood in order and he to was with Walt Disney and I'm like he was <laughs> with Walt Disney I love Disney and Tomorrowland and all that I'm thinking yeah I watched that I probably was watching that yeah you know yeah. and absolutely I don't know I understand I don't I don't you can't judge it you don't know what would you would do in that situation if you were it's it's your life on the line and you can't make a difference if That's you right. die I, also I don't think- I don't know that we are in uh, a time, so we are looking at this in retrospect with very different eyes and very different expectations. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was a time, as you all know, not so long ago, when people's private lives were their business. And um, that, you know, we knew of someone in the public eye by maybe the work that they did. Um, So I, I think that Yes, the American government, we now know, sort of buried some of uh, Von Braun's past, but maybe um, Americans weren't expecting to know, you know, every detail of Von Braun's life before he was, you know, uh, an American citizen working on behalf of the American people. Christina? I wondered if you had trouble researching the Russian Hmm. uh, Karolev and what I... I mean, to move on a little, I like the way you went back and forth between those two men and they, and you very clearly, I never knew any, I never heard of this Russian, but then I knew a lot about him by the end. And I wondered if it was hard, um, you know, because he is Russian and so many things were kept secret in the Soviet Union, whether or how you were able to to research his background. Yeah, that seems like it would have been the harder piece of the puzzle, Amy. Yeah, exactly. It's interesting. Um, it, it wasn't, it wasn't. Um, I, I mean, there. if you go to Huntsville and you used to live there, I mean, it is, it is Von Braun town. Yes. There's a theater named after him. I mean, he is like the hero of that town. And um, I mean, understandably, I mean, Huntsville is one of the most technologically um, advanced and or the industry there. I mean, it's all technology and um, incredibly prosperous and because of the space program and because of what Von, Von Brown did there. And so I had this, this sense going in that, you know, I went to the archives at Huntsville um, and poured over his papers and speeches and photographs. And the more I read, the more I realized how meticulously curated his life was in the United States. He was a master at um, at crafting um, an image for himself. He knew exactly the kind of baggage he was bringing with him when he came to this country. And he was so wildly charismatic. Um, he knew he was attractive. You know, he used all of these, these parts of himself to... Um, just absolutely dazzle people. And I thought he's gonna be the easy one to write about because there's all this stuff about him. And then you can't, you can't get to the real part of who Von Braun was because his image is so painstakingly crafted and the people that know him best, his um, wife who I believe is still surviving and his children, they never talk about him for obvious reasons um, because they just don't wanna reignite all of this, this controversy about him. But um, in saying that, um, Korolev was actually easier to, it was easier to understand Korolev's emotional life um, because the people that worked for him um, wrote about him in such um, descriptive, um, loving terms. Um, and I say that because, uh, you know, most of them had, well, they had all, you know, survived Stalin and they, they realized, you know, that he had been, he had been so horribly 
um, wronged by Stalin, that when they wrote about him um, after, many, many years after, you know, that they always brought this up, you know, what he had overcome. And so there are all of these um, records of his personality and things that he said that we don't have from Von Braun because he was too busy looking, you know, shiny and perfect. So there are all these lovely moments um, that have been collected by academics that have done just remarkable work in trying to restore the historical record um, with details about Korolev's life. Um, one in particular is um, Asif Siddiqui, who is a history professor at Fordham University and has written multiple books on Korolev, and they're all fantastic. They're very readable um, and also very technical, which is no small feat um, as a writer. But finding um, the, the heart of Korolev was, was much easier, despite the fact that so much of his life um, to this day remains secret. Um, there's a multi-volume biography of Korolev that is of Korolev's life um, by a man named Golovinov, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. It's never been translated into English, and nor could I get it, nor could I get it translated, um, nor could I have afforded to translate this multi-volume. I mean, it's a massive collection of books. Um, so I had to decide early on, um, you know, which source I was going to rely on. And really, uh, when I when I interviewed um, this history professor, Asif Siddiqui, I said, you know, I, I need to use this material you found because I don't, unless you can tell me where to go looking for it. And he said, no, use it with my blessing and source it because, you know, this is my life's work, you know, is to sort of bring this man to life and you're telling this story for the next generation. So, you know, this is why you have to do it this way. Um, I don't, um, it didn't, it didn't, it was never my intention to travel to Russia. I don't speak Russian. I think it would require someone who had a very, um, a very fluent command of the language to do the kind of research that it would take. And I think other, you know, history professors have certainly already done that work for me. So um, for all of us really, but so Korolev, bottom line, I'm, I'm rambling, I'm sorry, but Korolev was the more emotionally accessible character, ironically. His story was just, um, I don't even know. I felt for this man in every turn yeah, from the time too. that he was yeah. a young man until the time that he passed away. Yeah. Um, do people have thoughts on him? Um, one of the questions that you had put in uh, to the uh, question bank, Amy, was if you got to spend a day with one or the other, which one would you choose and why yeah. would you ask them? But yeah. uh, I don't know. I, I'm really sort of... Um, feel very sympathetic towards Korolev and, and his story. And um, of course, this is somebody that probably, you know, he was kept purposely secret for most of yeah. his career. Yeah. Um, and so we're sort of getting to know him through uh, your work and the work of others. Yeah. But I feel like he just wouldn't have time for me, even though he might be the one that I pick, he would not have time to talk to me. He would not be bothered with somebody who just didn't know, you know, one thing from the other. But, That's a really good point. I never thought about it. I think you're exactly right about that. Yeah. Yeah. His 18 hours a day working would not be yeah. spent, minute of them would not be wasted on me. <laughs> Christina. Oh, nevertheless. When you ask that question, it's sort of interesting. After what Amy said, I think I would like to spend more time with the Russian than with von Braun, simply because of that facade and because uh, the Russian just seemed more human to me. Yeah. Somehow there was something much more. Uh, yes, he worked himself to death, literally. Literally, yeah. yeah. Literally, he yeah. worked himself to death. But I always had this sense that he was more, there was something more human and perhaps more approachable about him. Whereas to spend a day with Von Braun uh, would be extremely intimidating scary almost yeah. <laughs> I don't know that's just my reaction yeah. I don't yeah. know what other people think but I liked reading about the Russian because I and also because I didn't know nothing about yeah. that yeah he was up against just unimaginable odds I feel like it's amazing um, Von Braun 
you know, Von Braun's problems were first world problems, you know, right. uh, do the, does the Navy get to go before the army, you know, am I going to get such and so millions instead of such and so, millions? you know, it's like, they were first world problems, whereas Korolev, he literally doesn't have money, he doesn't have men, he doesn't have materials, he doesn't have anything, but you better get it done anyway, because right. your life is on the line. That's right. You know, right. it was, um, you know, he was scrappy, um, oh, yeah. making these um, uh, advances in technology happen, and for, yeah. you know, the first part of the space race was doing it better Absolutely. than the Americans. Oh, yeah. And we never talk about that either. I mean, they kicked our butt during the early days of the space race. And we never talk about that. It's like, oh, moon landing, 1969, yay. Let's just but, focus on that. The thing that yeah, we look want over here. <laughs> look over here. Right. But, you know, we, 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 we could have easily, if it had not have been for Kennedy, we probably would have lost. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what do you, what do other, what do others of you think, Von Braun or Korolev? Like, who, who are you spending your day with? It's funny when you said that, Amy, that um, Von Braun ended up being the more um, emotionally elusive because I thought, okay, if I got to meet both, what would I want to ask about? And Korolev, I wanted to ask like technical questions. How did this happen? Why did you decide on the the chrome for Sputnik and like all these little that was, details? That was a great yeah. anecdote. All the like details and Von Braun, I was like, what do you feel? What do you regret this? Right. Do you like the like? Because I just didn't. Yeah, I didn't get any of that from him. So yeah. without me even realizing it, I I understood that by reading it too. My questions were based on what I wasn't getting from them. Right. Yeah. Carol, Sandy, Catherine, Christine, do y'all have thoughts? <laughs> I would spend it with. Von Braun, because I'm curious, I was a publicist in New York City for 30 years, so mm. I'm used to the more surface approach. And I'm curious- That, that you would underneath. get from him, I think. <laughs> yeah, I want to know what's underneath. Did you study his parents? I did, I did, yes, what? somewhat. I didn't delve into their lives a lot, but they were, um, they, they were wealthy, um, you know, German landholders um, who, um, uh, just absolutely doted on their children. Um, and I always thought it was uh, one of the things that struck me very early on in reading about Von Braun, what, and I include part of her quotation in the book, is when his mother says, you know, even when he acted up, you know, it was just a brief spell of naughtiness and even naughtiness. And even she talks about how he just charmed the daylights out of her. You know, and I, and I kind of, I mean, more than once I thought, you know, is he a sociopath? Like, it sounds like it. Actually. You know, like, I mean, he was masterful at, um, you know, I'm almost glad that he was, you know, spending all of his time building rockets and not, you know, doing something, you know, de more deliberately nefarious, you know, more overtly nefarious because he was so brilliant and so just gifted at that getting what he wanted to focus his energy on but he delivered this is the thing about von brown it's like he made these promises and that like grappling with that kind of i don't even think confidence touches this quality that von brown had you know and i i broached this topic towards the end of the book because i was just asking myself i'm like what was it that made him able to do all these things you know was it ego was it hubris was it you know, and I actually, you know, wonder, I mean, was he, you know, kind of a little bit of a sociopath? Like, you know, no, I haven't read any, you know, sort of, you know, clinical work that anyone's tried to do on his personality. I mean, in good luck because his image was so meticulously crafted. But um, yeah, I, I wonder, I wonder what he was, I, I would love to know what he was like. I drove past his house, oh, such a weird, I did so many weird things researching this book, but I found his house in Huntsville. I'm sure I'm not the only person to ever do this. Um, and it's just like on this, it was, it's a, you know, beautiful home, but it's not, it's pretty nondescript, you know, I mean, it looks like it was built in the 1950s, um, and it's sort of modern-ish, but it's tucked back in this driveway, and there's a lot of trees, and you can't just stop and gawk at it because of the way it is in this curve, and so the people that live there now were home, and I kept driving, I bet I drove back past it 10 times, like, trying to, like, I'm like, they're gonna think I'm trying to, you know, rob them or something, but I was just desperate for some piece of this man that I could never, you know, he was always just slipping through my fingers. Um, whereas Corey Love, I felt like, you know, if you're ever a person who has wanted anything and has had to accept the fact that you're going to lose 
And are you going to be able to find it within yourself to try again? And who among us has that not happened to? Like he was just deeply human, um, you know, in a way that, that Von Brown was, was not at all. As a dog lover, can we talk about the dogs oh, for a second? <laughs> so hard. <laughs> I was practically crying every time you wrote about these poor Moscow street dogs oh, yeah. who were um, used, uh, you know, in some of the, the Russian rockets to, to test sort of um, life support systems and, yeah. and things like that. I just, I, I mean, I, I realize so that testing on animals is usually, yeah. you know, the, the step between yeah. sort of theory and humans. Yeah. Um, I just, I don't know. I was really like sympathizing with the dogs and thinking yeah. about how scared they must have been and how yeah. poor one of them vomited and then probably yeah. had to live with the vomit for, you yeah. know, multiple orbits around the earth, you know. Absolutely. It was one of the hardest chapters of the book to write. And I wrote this book, um, sort of episodically, um, and then would try to go back and, you know, sort of make sure everything flowed. Um, and I put off writing that like a chapter for ages because I'm a dog lover and I couldn't, and my, my dog who, who I don't have anymore, um, but he was about the size of Leica. And I, I cannot imagine, um, I, I just, and, and Corlev was a dog lover. Like that's the other thing. He loved dogs. And he would go um, see the dogs and. Yeah. yeah. And there's no record that Laika was the dog that, that barked when he went in there. There was a, there was one dog that always sort of barked that seemed to really respond to Korolev every time he came into this place where they kept the dogs. And I tried like, I, I tried as hard as I could to find out if that was Laika. I like to think that it was. I also don't want to think that it was. It's such a perfect story if it was Laika. Um, but that was, uh, it was excruciating to write. I had to go back to that chapter a couple of times because I just kept sort of skirting the, very much the broad strokes. My editor was like, you're going to have to tell us like how they put the dog in the rocket and how far the rocket was off the ground. And I was like, I can't do it. Well, I think that what bothered me most is that they started sending up dogs before they even had Absolutely. a chance, uh, a, um, yeah. a plan to recover them. So they're right. sending them up to certain death. Yeah. just to find out some things and um, well in the first one because it was a publicity stunt you know because um you know um uh, Khrushchev was like oh another space spectacular what can we do you know what can we do next and Korolev's like you know ever the showman like you know desperate for money but like tap dancing for his you know for his supper like what if we put a dog in there you know I sort of feel like it was this kind of desperate thing and there was no it was more about the you know about showing the world that the Soviets could do this incredible thing. We can launch a live animal into space. It doesn't matter if we can get her back or not. It's just, we do it because we can, which so right. much of science is, whether or not we should. Uh, one of uh, the questions, and we probably only have time for one more of these questions, but it's, um, you had asked, do you think the cost of the space race was justified? And I, I think that people have had that sort of dilemma you know, 60 years ago, yeah. 70 years ago, but now as well, because we're talking yeah. about exorbitant sums of yeah. money, which seems really hard to reckon when you think about, um, you know, global warming and housing right. shortages, um, food scarcity, all of these yeah. things that could benefit from that money in order yeah. to, uh, you know, help the plight of humankind on our own yeah. planet. Yeah. And so how do people sort of feel about balancing, you know, uh, space research or any sort of research really with some of these really, um, you know, immediate human needs? So much of space research has benefited our lives, daily lives on earth that I, I can't not say it's worth it. And I'm just like Amy, I'm such a fan of watching it all happen. <laughs> yeah, I think the breakthroughs are used in our everyday lives in a million ways. So I, I do think it's worth it. I'm not sure putting people on Mars is worth it, but, but yeah, there's just so much to be gained from it. Yeah. Uh, the process of 
can we get people to Mars will result, I think, in so many discoveries that it makes the, the trying even. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, no, I think it's worth it also. Man has always been curious about what's beyond, uh, you know, it's not just the space program. I think since the beginning of time, there has been a curiosity about what we don't know and, and exploration. And, and I mean, just read about the explorers in the early days and what they put themselves through to, to learn more. So yes, it's an, you're absolutely right. It's an exorbitant amount of money and our world always feels, and maybe even more so now, feels like it's falling apart in so many ways in our country because of what we've just been through. And yes, we could use that money. The reality is that the government doesn't use that money to you know, build new housing. Let's take money from NASA and give people homes. No, I mean, I don't think. So I think the reality is that it's, for me, it's worth it, and I think it's always going to happen. Somebody's going to, you know, this curiosity of what comes next and what's beyond our world. Thanks, Christina. Whitney, uh, do you want to just talk a little bit about the exhibition that this book uh, was chosen to complement? Oh, sure. The the book that proved my whole thesis, you know, as a bias, I was telling Amy that, you know, the whole point of it was, I wanted to look at the anniversary of the beginning of the launch of the Apollo mission and what that meant in our American art collection and how you could see that interest progressing through, you know, Newcomb Pottery making the Moss and Moonlight series in the 1930s and what that meant. And then in the late 60s, Paul Soldner creating these vases that look like the moon and putting his giant handprint right on it and how that whole process happened while this space race was happening. Um, and then realizing oh yeah I, it wasn't that at all it started way before that and really being interested to learn more about that with Amy's book I think was the highlight for me thanks Whitney yeah um so Sandy has posed a question in the chat box um do you have a favorite space movie um which I think is a really great question because you know these these films and we have had movies about space since there were movies <laughs> yeah. and Whitney has actually um, uh, assembled some really great highlights uh, over the 19th and 20th and 21st centuries of, of our fascination with uh, space and the arts um, and those are on our YouTube playlist which is clickable through um, the Meeting the Moon website uh, on our on the museum site um, but does anybody have any recommendations? Uh, Amy said her favorite space film is The Right Stuff. Space Odyssey, 2001 Space Odyssey. 2001 Space so Odyssey. Good. I think I knew you were going to say that, Whitney. Yeah. <laughs> Sandy, since you asked the question. <laughs> I, I have enjoyed so many of them that The Right Stuff is my favorite, but honestly, The Martian is pretty darn good, too. <laughs> okay, a more recent <laughs> choice. Okay. Really Catherine, you had your hand up. I just wanted to say something else about the, the money that we're spending. Um, sure. it, one, one piece of it that I think that is very powerful is that it is a collective thing that we as a country can look to together without, um, that, that helps us in a way come together. Do you know what I mean? Like that we're all focused on this common thing that as a country we're doing. And I think that's powerful. And I know you can't put money on that. I think that anything that will unify us, that's a common uh, goal that's, that looks, that is good for all of us, maybe, you know what I mean? And I think that is good for, for right now. I think, um, anyway, we don't have anything like that. And that's a powerful, powerful thing. So I think that's worth a lot. Thanks, Catherine. Yeah. And did you have a favorite movie? I think The Martian. I'm so glad Sandy said Okay, that. Sandy and I Catherine. love that. And I wasn't expecting to. I thought, how am I going to watch him just here by himself with no, like, is it just him? 
you know, on the, you know what I, I went in with like, what is this about? I loved it. It's loved like it. Tom Hanks on the desert Island, you know, are yeah, we really like, going to watch almost, this guy? For yeah, the next few hours? yeah. Yeah. I loved that movie. Yeah. Carol, Thank you me. look like you had a contribution. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, I will say, and I've told both Amy and Whitney this, I'm a little obsessed. I'm currently obsessed with alternate histories. And for those of you that might have uh, Apple TV Plus, there's a great show called um, For All Mankind. And uh, they've had two seasons so far. But the basic premise of the show is uh, Russia got to the moon first. So that's the basic premise of the show. And then like everything uh, goes from there. I have been absolutely enthralled with that show. And um, have you been watching it, Amy? I, there was one moment that I was hoping was going to happen in that series, no spoilers. And when it happened, I literally jumped off the sofa and ran in a screaming circle around the living room. Like we're going to have pumping into the air. Yeah. (laughs) But um, what was really great, I think, about reading your book, Amy, is I was able to actually see, you know, oh, they must have been basing this character on this real person. Or, you know, now I understand a little bit more about this character that I saw on the show. And it's really great. Anyway, if anybody has Apple TV Plus, I recommend the visuals are spectacular. Um, So watch it in HD if you can. I wanted to share one thing. Uh, Go ahead, Whitney. I was going to say one thing I did go back and watch on YouTube. Um, I'm too young to have seen it, but I wanted to see Walter Cronkite reporting on the launch where the ceiling was coming in. And you you can listen to it and see it on YouTube. And I I really enjoyed being pointed to that. Oh, yeah. you should have, you should have sent me the link. We could have watched oh, it yeah. together. <laughs> well, anyway, thank you everyone for coming. I did just want to uh, thank Amy. Thank, thank you, you all so much. For writing this was thrilling. This book, and thank you for publishing it at exactly the same time that Whitney was putting together her exhibition. The timing was just so serendipitous, although it really wasn't because you, you both like had the exhibit or she had her exhibition. You had your book published this year because it's the 60th anniversary of the Apollo program. Uh, So thank you both for being here today. Um, I did want to let everyone know uh, our next meeting will be September the 8th. Um, We will uh, be discussing the book Art Curious, Stories of the Unexpected, Slightly Odd, and Strangely Wonderful in Art by Jennifer DeSalle, and we will be joined by Jennifer DeSalle in person because (laughs) this is our last virtual discussion bound. We will start meeting again in September at the museum. Uh, We have, uh, with the blessing of Malaprops, we have outgrown their space, um, and so they have given us our blessing to start meeting here in person at the museum. Uh, And instead of second Tuesdays, it'll be second Wednesdays. So we will meet next September the 8th, which is the second Wednesday at 12 p.m. here at the museum. So of course, uh, you're all on our email list so you'll get notification of that. Uh, Jennifer DeSalle is also a North Carolinian. Um, She is a a curator at the North Carolina Museum of Art and hosts a podcast called Art Curious. So if you'd like to get that book or listen to her podcast, you've got a couple of months before our next meeting. So enjoy the rest of your summer, everyone. Look forward to seeing you in person next time we have a book discussion. Take care.